When climbing in an aircraft, your ears will suddenly pop due to that sudden drop of pressure. And the pressure changes on the Earth's surface are a huge driving factor in the weather that we experience. So what is pressure anyway? And how do we use surface pressure patterns to help predict what the weather is going to be? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the third class in the Meteorology series. In this class, we're going to be continuing our breakdown of the atmosphere and take a deeper dive into the pressure element. Pressure is given by the formula that P equals F over A, force over area. If we consider a column of air, maybe, I don't know, one kilometre high, something like that, it's not really important, with a fixed um, surface area as we travel up, then as we get higher up the column, the weight of the air which is the mass times the acceleration due to gravity, reduces and reduces as we travel up the column. There's also fewer particles higher up and more particles lower down because they're basically being pulled down by gravity. So if we look at this section of air down near the surface, it has a larger amount of air particles pushing down on it when you compare that to this section of air up near the top. This means that the force element, the weight element, of our pressure equation reduces as we get higher up. And that, in turn, makes the pressure reduce. And then down near the bottom, there's more weight, so that's more force, and that means there's more pressure. So we can say that as altitude increases, the pressure decreases. The standard rate at the, which this happens is we reduce in pressure by one hectopascal for every 27 or 30 feet for quick calculations. We measure pressure in hectopascals, which is exactly the same thing as a millibar. So one hectopascal is one millibar. And in the, the United States, they measure things, and in some other countries, I'm sure they measure things in inches of mercury as well. And in the international standard atmosphere, the sea level pressure is equal to 1013.25 hectopascals or 1013.25 millibars, which is the equivalent of 29.92 inches of mercury as well. Altimeters work by sensing the difference in pressure between a datum point and the current pressure, and then you multiply the difference by that 27 foot per hectopascal lapse rate. We can set a few things as our datum. We can have the QFE, the QNH, or the standard setting. I've made a video previously on altimetry in the general navigation series, where I go into a bit more detail. I'll link that below. And if you're happy with pressure settings and stuff like that, what QNH are, what QFE are, and standard, then continue watching this video. But if you're unhappy, I'd recommend you pause this, go and watch that other one first to explain all of these terms. Okay, so we have the date and pressure settings of QNH, QFE, and standard. And meteorologists, we use one more, which is called the QFF. This is the pressure setting measured at the airfield or weather station, corrected down to the sea level pressure setting for the actual day's conditions. This is different to QNH because QNH uses the standard one hectopascal every 27 feet. Whereas the QFF is giving the um, adjusted lapse rate. You can think of it as that because temperature variations have an influence on this lapse rate. Temperature corrections are very important when flying, usually in cold air because the air levels, the pressure levels become compressed together and your true altitude is lower than your indicated altitude. So the QFF factors in this temperature correction. And the correction that we normally apply is four feet for every thousand feet for every degree of ISA deviation. Or as a good rule of thumb, you can use a 1% altitude error for every 2.5 degrees of ISA de deviation. So that's where the main difference is between QFF and QNH. QNH is using 27 feet per hectopascal and the QFF is factoring in this temperature correction 
to in order to give us a different lapse rate so you'll get the more accurate sea level pressure for that day when using QFF which is why meteorologists like to use it because it's better for predicting weather whereas us aviators we use Q&H because it's not really that important um, for the majority of things it's only when it gets really cold that you see significant changes in your altitude. So I'm just going to do a quick example of the temperature error calculation. For more information, as, as I said before, go back and watch that video on altimetry that was in the GNAB series. So this example will assume that you're comfortable with a few of the definitions, vertical distances, etc. Um, yeah, so anyway, an aircraft is at flight level 200 where the temperature is minus 40 degrees C. The Q and H at a nearby airfield is 998 hectopascals. There's an obstacle en route at 800 feet. What obstacle clearance does the aircraft have? So draw the effing picture. Flight level 200 equals 20,000 feet in pressure altitude and that's based off of standard which is 1013. So I'll draw a line here, 1013 and 20,000 feet above that is our aircraft. We then have the Q&H which is going to be a lower pressure of 998 and that's going to be higher up so it's going to be somewhere up here and then we can find out the distance in here to find out our indicated altitude which is above the Q&H. So this distance is very easy to calculate 1013 minus 998 times 27 which is equal to 405 feet so this distance in here 405 feet which means our indicated altitude our height above the Q and H is going to be 20,000 minus 405 so our indicated alt I don't know why I've done that I alt um, equals 20,000 minus 405 which is equal to 19595 feet so that's our indicated altitude. We apply temperature corrections to this to get our true altitude. So we have to figure out the ISA deviation. So normally at 20,000 feet, the temperature would be 15 degrees and then two degrees per thousand feet. So 15 minus 40 is gonna be minus 25. So ISA at 20,000 feet. So ISA temperature at 20,000 feet is minus 25 degrees Celsius and it today is minus 40 so the ISA deviation it is 15 degrees colder equals minus 15 degrees and then we apply the temperature correction so it's four feet for every thousand feet that we're above so let's call that 20 or more accurately 19.6 I suppose it should be that's our indicated altitude 0.6 and then we per also multiply that and multiply this by the 15 degrees 4 times the 19.6 for our in thousand of feet above the Q and H and then times that by our ISA deviation 15 and that's 1176 1176 feet of altitude correction to make and we're going to be lower because it is colder than ISA everything's getting squished together so it's going to be this answer, take away this number. So our true alt is equal to, uh, let's just do that on the calculator, 19,595 minus 1,176. That's going to be 18,419 feet. And we're asking for the obstacle clearance. And so how far above this 8,000 feet obstacle are we? Just take away the 8,000. And our obstacle clearance is equal to 10,419 feet. Or, um, you don't have to do the temperature correction this way. You can do that 1% um, per 2.5 degrees of ISA deviation that I was talking about. So we'll do a quick calculation of that. So the ISA deviation is minus 15. So 15 divided by 2.5 is going to be 6. Right, so we're doing a 6% change um, in altitude. So 19,595 times 0 0.06, that's 6%. And we're looking at 1175.7, and the actual difference is 1176. So it's really, really close. It's really quite a good estimation. 
and then we would take that from the 19595 and that is our uh, answer in here and then you do this obstacle clearance the same way so the one percent per 2.5 degrees is just as good if not maybe a bit quicker than the temperature correction of four foot per thousand feet per degree of iso deviation so this is probably a diagram you've seen somewhere before or something a bit more colorful and a bit better than this but it's showing what we call isobars these lines are all lines of equal pressure and it's the calculated QFF from an airfield or the actual measured pressure at sea level. And every point along this line has exactly the same pressure. And the difference between the lines is normally either two or four hectopascals. So this would be 1,000, this would be 1,002, as with this one or this could be the other way around. So this could drop down to, or no, they're both going to highs, but this one here would be 998. This one here would be 998 and so on. And then you would drop down. These eyes of our charts can be named and labeled in various ways. We give the highest pressure um, on the chart an H and the lowest an L, but there can be obviously secondary high points with the same high pressure as this and secondary low points. Um, ice charts are very useful as pressure systems and areas have fairly predictable weather, um, which is something we'll learn about more in future classes. But just a quick example um, for you, it would be if the isobars are close together, it means that the wind is gonna be stronger than if they're quite far apart like this. So this is gonna be a very windy area. This will be very calm over here. There are many more patterns and predictions that can be made using isobars as well. As I said, we'll look at some of them in future classes. To summarize then, pressure is the force over the area and because we have fewer particles above us, that means that our weight is lower and our force is lower as we climb up through the atmosphere. So that means that our pressure reduces. So as altitude increases, the pressure decreases. The rate at which this happens is one hectopascal drop for every 27 feet increase in altitude or 30 feet for easy calculations. We measure pressure in hectopascals. One hectopascal is equivalent to one millibar. And in the international standard atmosphere at sea level, we have a 1013.25 hectopascal pressure or 1013.25 millibar pressure. Or if you're measuring it in somewhere that uses inches of mercury, it's 29.92 in Higgs inches of mercury, HGS being the chemical symbol for mercury. So in terms of altimetry, as I said, there's a good class, well, I think it's quite good, um, that I did in the GNAV series explaining about this a bit more. But basically, if you're setting Q and H, you're reading indicated altitude. If you're setting standard, which is 1013, then you're reading a pressure altitude or a flight level if you round it up and take off the last two zeros. And if you're setting QFE, you're reading height above the ground um, and the height of the ground from the sea level to the highest point of the ground is known as elevation. So Q and H is calculated by sensing the pressure at the airfield or the weather station, then using 27 feet per every hectopascal with your known elevation to calculate an equivalent sea level pressure. The QFF does this, but doesn't use a standard 27 feet per every hectopascal. It factors in temperature corrections. So it uses the daily lapse rate in a sense. Um, so it's the 27 feet adjusted for temperature and that temperature correction is four feet for every thousand feet um, for every degree of iso deviation or a good estimation, well, very accurate estimate, estimation is 1% of altitude for every 2.5 degrees of iso deviation. And then we have isobar charts, which use the QFF which is the equivalent sea level pressure or the actual measured sea level pressure. And the isobars all have equal pressure, iso meaning uh, the same, I believe. So iso bar, same bar lines, I don't know. Um, but yeah, they're all the same pressure and there's usually about a two or a four hectopascal difference between them all. So that'll be 1000, this would be 1002, 1004, and this would be 1006 which is actually not a very high pressure, but hey. Yeah, and we use the ice bar charts to help predict weather, which we'll look at in future, but just a quick sneak peek if 
the isobars are really close together, it means it's going to be a lot more windy than if they're quite spread apart.